If you eat the carnivore diet, you are going to die of scurvy. Have you heard this before? I certainly have. You know, the funny thing is, though, is I don't know anyone with scurvy, and I sure know a lot of carnivores. I don't know, maybe they're secretly sucking on limes, but I don't think so. So before I became a dietitian, I was a biochemist. So when anyone makes that bold statement to me of, I'm going to die if I don't eat plants, I want to take a moment and really think about the underlying mechanism. Could it be true? And if so, how? So I did a deep dive into vitamin C, and I want to share with you a little bit about what I have learned. But lest your heart be troubled, I want to jump ahead to the conclusion and reassure you that no, you are not going to die of scurvy if you choose not to eat plants. However, if you do eat carbohydrates, your vitamin C status might be of concern. Vitamin C is a water-soluble vitamin whose most buzzworthy function is as an antioxidant. However, it's worth noting that this activity, while observed in test tubes, is unproven in humans. Many supplementation trials have been done with no clear benefit in human disease conditions proposed to be caused by or resulting in oxidative stress. Other roles for vitamin C include being a cofactor in the synthesis of collagen, carnitine, norepinephrine, and peptide hormones. It is involved in phenylalanine and tyrosine metabolism, as well as iron absorption. Vitamin C plays a role in vasodilation, promotes resistance to infection, protects against alcohol toxicity, regenerates the antioxidant vitamin E, and is involved in bone health. The most well-known result of a vitamin C deficiency is a disease known as scurvy. The first record of scurvy came from the Egyptians in 1550 BC with reports of treatment using onions and vegetables. It was next detailed in the age of Hippocrates around 500 BC and was a well-documented problem on extended sea voyages, Arctic explorations, and in times of uncertain nutrition such as wars and famines, basically making an appearance whenever man relied solely on food and storage. An important point is that vitamin C appears to be used up faster in times of stress, which certainly would have accompanied these events. The hallmark of scurvy is decreased collagen production when the deficiency is extreme, and this results in swollen, bleeding gums and loss of teeth. Pain and lethargy become extreme, and death results if the deficiency is not resolved. When I was studying my dietitian degree at Tufts University, one of my professors, Dr. Lynn Osman, had recently published a paper on vitamin C. And at the time, she recommended to us students to read this book, The History of Scurvy and Vitamin C. And it's a really interesting read if you want to learn a little bit more about the subject. Plants and many animals can synthesize vitamin C, but humans can't. It seems that the ability to make vitamin C developed in amphibians about 350 million years ago as these aquatic vertebrates began to leave the water. This ability to make vitamin C may have provided them with some protection from the higher oxygen content of the air due to that antioxidant capacity of vitamin C. Then about 25 million years ago, um, this production ability was lost in a common ancestor, ancestor to humans and other primates. Uh, but this mutation was not lethal and humans continued to evolve and thrive, apparently getting adequate vitamin C from their food environment. What is really interesting is that at the same time, we lost the ability to break down uric acid, and many scientists hypothesize that this uric acid has taken over some of the antioxidant properties of vitamin C. Humans also use a very powerful antioxidant called glutathione that we produce ourselves, and what happens here is that higher levels of glutathione are produced when on a low-carb diet. And this effectively increases vitamin C recycling, thus decreasing our dietary need for it. Most people are aware that fruits and vegetables can be good dietary sources of vitamin C, with examples such as citrus fruit, strawberries, tomatoes, potatoes, spinach, cabbage, and cruciferous vegetables. However, ripeness, storage, and cooking methods all impact how much vitamin C is actually consumed and absorbed. 
The USDA maintains a database for nutrient contents of food, which forms the basis of major tracking apps like MyFitnessPal, Chronometer, and others. Except where specified, the vitamin C content quoted is the maximum, that is for the fresh, raw foods, and the actual available amount will often be significantly less. Worse, this database does not provide vitamin C content of meat, with the exception of liver, under the assumption that the content is so low compared to plant foods that it's not even worth recording. This critical omission is part of the reason that carnivores get far more vitamin C than previously assumed. In fact, we have proof that humans are able to consume adequate levels of vitamin C living on animal products alone by considering the Eskimos, the Maasai of Kenya and Tanzania, and the Sami, the indigenous people of Lapland. While it is likely that these populations were able to obtain some plant foods in the summer, they frequently went months at a time without. Since frank scurvy develops after about 4 to 12 weeks, depending on your baseline vitamin C status, we can conclude that they obtained adequate vitamin C from their animal-based diets. I would be remiss if I did not mention here the knowledge of Stefansson, the explorer, whose Arctic experiences led him to understand that eating a meat-only diet was sufficient to prevent scurvy. But once carbohydrates were introduced into the diet, meat alone was insufficient for prevention. This is likely why seafaring voyages required lime juice and other plant products to prevent scurvy, because the usual diet was so high in grains and low in meat and vegetables. He's published several books, such as this, The Friendly Arctic, and many um, research papers that are worth reading if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that. It is also interesting to note that because potatoes are high in vitamin C, the Irish did not suffer from scurvy until their crops failed. To be sure, that period was one of extreme famine and many died from outright malnutrition, but scurvy was rampant among the extremely impoverished who subsisted on limited cereal diets without any potato, very limited meat, fruit, or vegetables. In fact, when researchers want to induce scurvy in test animals, they feed them refined grains and sugar. I love this quote about historical diets. At the time of King Henry VIII, hardly any fruits or vegetables were eaten. Market gardening only came to England from Flanders around the beginning of the 17th century. Toward the end of the century, vegetables like peas, beans, cabbages, and a few others were grown for animal food in order to increase the supply of meat. And the diet in the 13 colonies and in the U.S. in the earlier days was not much different. So much for the notion of eating the rainbow that I heard so often as I trained to become a dietitian. When we eat food containing vitamin C, we need to absorb it from our digestive tract to the blood, which carries it around our body so it can be taken up by cells to be used. In order to get from the digestive tract to the blood, and then from the blood to the cells, it must travel through cell walls. This is done through special pores or transporters. Now, vitamin C actually exists in two forms. The reduced form, ascorbic acid, or AA, which is the form present in the food we eat. This is readily oxidized to form dehydroscorbic acid, or DHA, which is better absorbed. DHA is absorbed using the GLUT1, 3, and 4 transporters and are what we call saturable and dose dependent. This means that at low doses, most vitamin C will be absorbed, but when the dose becomes larger, the transporters will clog up and no greater amounts can be absorbed, so it will instead be excreted. When you hear that you're peeing out your vitamins, this is what's going on. These GLUT transporters, however, are not specific for vitamin C. Glucose also enters cells through them, so the two will compete. In fact, as you can see here, the structure of glucose very closely resembles vitamin C. This is not surprising since, in animals that can make vitamin C, it's actually made from glucose. So, if a person were to eat an orange, we cannot know how much will be absorbed from the gut because glucose is also present and competing for that transport. Okay, so it is fair to say that we humans require some vitamin C from our food. 
But how much? This, of course, is the question that various governmental bodies try to establish to guide our dietary choices. And as per usual, the foundation of the dietary guidelines are weak. There seems to be agreement that we need somewhere between 10 and 30 milligrams daily to prevent scurvy. During World War II, the average intake in England was estimated to be 20 milligrams daily with no evidence of widespread vitamin C deficiency. In 1943, a study of five prisoners was undertaken where they were depleted of vitamin C to the point of having symptoms of scurvy and then had it returned to their diet. Never mind the ethics or the small sample size, it was determined that an RDA of 70 milligrams per day would provide people with enough vitamin C to prevent scurvy with a four-week margin of safety. Um, In 1996, another study, this time involving seven men aged 20 to 26, um, consuming a mixed diet, was performed. It found that as vitamin C dose increased from 0 to 200 milligrams, there was a steep increase in plasma concentration of vitamin C. But beyond 200 milligrams, the concentration plateaued, meaning that very little more vitamin C was absorbed at those higher doses. So based on this, the Institute of Medicine recommended that the daily dose should be increased to 200 milligrams per day to maximize that plasma concentration with minimal losses, although this never did become an official recommendation. Further, they noted that this would be easily obtained by eating five fruits and vegetables per day, in case you ever wondered where that came from. It's interesting to note that different countries have selected different recommendations based on these same studies. In the UK, for example, they opted to recommend a lower amount, choosing only 30 milligrams per day. And that was because the ministers there figured that there was no way they would be able to get their population to eat that much fruit and vegetable per day. Never mind the science. Indeed, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Study, or NHANES, dataset indicates that Americans, on average, only consume between 70 and 80 milligrams per day. Currently, the dietary guidelines recommend 75 milligrams for adult females and 90 milligrams for adult males with increased needs for smokers. For reference, a half cup of freshly squeezed orange juice contains 60 milligrams of vitamin C as does two-thirds of a cup of raw broccoli. Today's recommendations addresses recent concerns about meeting antioxidant needs due to work by Linus Pauling, who advocated for much higher intakes. This latest RDA is based on estimates of body pool or tissue levels that are deemed adequate to provide antioxidant protection with minimal urinary loss. These estimates were made by combining the data from the previous studies in young males with experiments done in test tubes evaluating antioxidant activity of vitamin C. Of course, we have no way of knowing whether these reactions are relevant in human beings. According to a U.S. epidemiological study, 8.2% of males and 6% of females had plasma vitamin C levels below the deficiency threshold of 11 micromoles per liter. The preponderance of people with low vitamin C status are those who smoke, are hospitalized, and alcoholics or other malnourished populations. And here I might add that perhaps some of our patients with diabetes or obesity could also be included in that population group. Getting enough vitamin C on a carnivore diet is one of the most persistent concerns of people interested in this all-meat way of life. But remember, this concern is based on the mainstream dietary fallacy that meat contains no vitamin C. Recent research confirms that fresh beef has approximately 10 milligrams per pound, salmon roe has 16 milligrams per 100 gram serving, six oysters contain 3.3 milligrams, and one 100 grams of raw liver has 1.3 milligrams of vitamin C. Hardly zero and likely enough to prevent scurvy if no carbohydrates are consumed, since less vitamin C will be needed. Also, when you are carnivore, your body is less dependent on vitamin C for collagen production. The reason we need vitamin C for collagen production is that it is the catalyst for the conversion of the amino acids proline and lysine to hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine, respectively. But when you're carnivore, 
these products are in ample supply. That is, you're eating animal collagen, which is readily used to make yours. Like eats like, and all of that. I would also like to mention a concept introduced by Dr. Stephen Finney. There appears to be an alternative biochemical pathway for preventing scurvy that occurs when one is eating a fat-burning ketogenic diet as opposed to a sugar-burning glucogenic diet. While the mechanism of action is not entirely clear, it is considered to be established fact. Dr. Finney has speculated that the blood ketone beta-hydroxybutyrate may itself be the antiscorbutic factor. If true, it would seem that scurvy is impossible if one is in ketosis, something I find very interesting. So, while humans likely need some vitamin C, the actual amount needed for optimal health remains widely debated, particularly in light of the fact that the RDA determinations were done in people consuming the standard American diet. Also, these were done in young males. Do these recommendations really meet the needs of older Americans, considering that around 92% of Americans have some degree of metabolic disease or insulin resistance? Indeed, many scientists today argue that people with obesity should, like smokers, also consume more vitamin C based on increased losses due to inflammation, stress, and higher glucose intakes that compete for absorption. Nearly 40 years ago, before we even knew that glucose and vitamin C competed for transport, in fact, even before diabetes was the scourge it is today, a general hypothesis was proposed that linked vitamin C status to diabetes. Research shows that red blood cells of diabetics have lower vitamin C, which may be contributing to the microvascular hypoxia that is the hallmark of diabetic vascular disease. So, while scurvy is rare in the United States today, questions remain about subclinical deficiency and the possible relationship to chronic disease and all sequelae from oxidative stress. Indeed, one of the physiological functions of vitamin C is to detoxify the histamine that is formed in response to various stress conditions, and so increased intake is likely promoting that detoxification pathway. It's regularly found that people with type 2 diabetes have lower circulating concentrations of vitamin C, and randomized controlled trials that increase intakes in this population have found significant improvements in blood sugar homeostasis, decreased insulin resistance, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as well as improved blood pressure. So the bottom line is no, you're not going to die of scurvy if you follow a carnivore diet. In fact, you won't even need to squeeze lime juice into your water, although you can if you want to. However, if you consume a high-carbohydrate diet, your needs for vitamin C are probably greater, and perhaps even greater than the 75 to 90 milligrams per day recommended by the dietary guidelines. Thank you so much for listening. This was a really fun project for me, and I hope that you've learned as much as I did.